Welcome to another episode of Talking with Kevin and Son. Hi, my name is Kevin McLemore. I am your host, three-time published author, speaker, and I'm joined with my co-host, my son by choice, Ife, that go-to guy. He is an entertainment entrepreneur, and he is part of the RMK family. We are joined today with two very special people, Miss Andrea Crabtree and Mr. Jeff Robinson. But before we get to that, I want to say one thing. This episode is brought to you by RMK Productions and the 10 United Podcast Network. Through the power of story, our mission is to uplift through the power of our voice, inspire, share stories and experiences and perspectives using the framework of teaching, learning, and modeling. Our purpose is very simple, is hope, helping other people every single day. Now, this episode is a conversation needing to be had. Jeffrey Robinson is the founder and the CEO and the creator of the Who Are We Project, a documentary um, chronicling um, racism in America, in Black America. It's the incomplete, inaccurate truth about racism. For some, this conversation may be uncomfortable, and for some, this conversation is a conversation needing to be had. So I hope those of you that are tuning in right now will understand that we're gonna start off the top of this uh, interview with some questions that I have, Ife have, and a lot of other, other people would like to ask, especially my non-melanated friends. So I wanna welcome the founder and CEO of the Who We Are Project, there's a Netflix documentary that chronic chronicalizes racism here in America. Jeffrey is a graduate of Harvard Law School. He has spent more than a dec four decades in experiencing uh, with experience in working with criminal and racial issues. Mr. Robinson is a nationally recognized trained attorney and respected teacher and trial advocate. Hopefully I'll get all this right. He is also <laughs> a member of the National Criminal Defense College and he has lectured um, for trials and all over the United States. On Netflix, Mr. Robinson's groundbreaking film has painted a bullseye on the truth of anti-racism here in the United States, the land of the free and the home of the brave. But who are we? Is this a story that needs to be told? Or is this a story that needs to be told the way other people wanna tell it? I wanna welcome our guest, Mr. Jeffrey Robinson, hero and warrior to the truth. Welcome, Mr. Robinson. Thank you very much for that very kind intro. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Well, I, I will tell you this. I, I was, when I looked at your bio and I'm going, I, I went through college with a learning disability. When I looked at that bio, I said, I know I'm gonna flunk this test. <laughs> but uh, you have done so much, um, not only to educate trial lawyers on the subject um, of racism, but with this film, you have done a lot more. And um, I, I know when I watched it um, for the first time, I watched it at midnight and I cried. I, there were a lot of things that I, I knew and a lot of things that um, I, I were confirmed and a lot of things that I, I learned. But the one thing that I, I did learn is nothing's changed from the time that my mother marched with Martin Luther King um, in Dayton, Ohio, the burning of Third Street. She started Action Incorporated to the assassination of Dr. King, to the protests that we see in the streets now, not a lot has changed. And, um, but your, your documentary gives us hope. And, I, and, I, and I'm gonna urge people before and after, watch this over and over again, share it, tell a friend, do not let this conversation just land on you with this interview. So, um, Jeff, uh, I'm going to start with some tough questions um, before we talk about your film. Who are we? African American, colored, Black American, Negro. Our people struggle with trying to identify ourselves with our community. And some of our white counterparts are also struggling with how to identify and recognize us as friends and foe. What's right or wrong? Who are we as people? How do we identify ourselves and how should we call ourselves? I don't plan or I don't think I can speak for an entire 
uh, community of people that identify as either African-American or Black American. And uh, while words and terms are important, I think it's the commonality of experience that is uh, the significant thing. Because um, as I say in the movie, I have uh, a nephew slash son who is Taino Indian, Puerto Rican, and African-American. And he's proud of every bit of that those parts of his her heritage. If he walks down the street and two police officers see him and get on their radio, they're gonna say young black male, 25 years old, walking down the street. And so there is a self-identification issue that you identify and then an identification issue in the country and the community and the society that you're living in. So whether I choose to call myself black American or African American, is has some significance, but I think it has little significance when compared to the issue of how are people in our community, however broadly you want to paint that community, how have our people been treated in a systemic way in this country, and how are those treatments, how is that systemic injury tied to what happened 10 years ago and 20 years ago? and 200 years ago. All right. Absolutely. So we're, we're moving into the, the next one. Is, um, so here's my question. What is a bigot? What is a racist? And what is a white supremacist? <clears throat> That's interesting because I think those, uh, the, the, again, words are important. A bigot could be identified as somebody who has a prejudice against any group of people. And so I think we all understand what prejudice means, but racism can't be reduced to, to just prejudice. It's something more than that. So bigot, you can kind of equate at least at, at some level with the fact that a person is simply prejudiced. Now, the second term you said was what before white supremacist? Racist. Racism. Racism is something different. Racism has bigotry or prejudice as a necessary but not sufficient ingredient to completely define the term. So, so racism, so excuse me, bigotry or prejudice is part of the definition of racism, but there are two more parts that are critical. One is social power and one is legal authority. It's one thing if I say, I don't like people with freckles and red hair. I am bigoted against them. I have a prejudice against them. I personally want to treat them in ways that are not human. But if that's just my personal choice, that doesn't describe and explain what's happened in America. It's when I have the social power and the legal authority to take that prejudice, prejudice or bigotry and then enforce it through systems so that it is now impacting everybody with freckles and red hair. That's when we get to racism. And so there is a clear difference between prejudice and racism. And when people try and equate the two, I think that's where a lot of confusion comes up because I always tell people, I can be the most prejudiced person in any room I walk into in this country, but I can't be a racist in America because I have never had the ability, the social power or the legal authority in my community to enforce my prejudice on other people. So I can't be, uh, there is no such thing as reverse racism in America. There is prejudice that can be identified in every community that exists, but this reverse racism thing is a joke. And, you know, the last thing was white supremacy. And I think, again, our words are important. White supremacy, the concept of white supremacy is a real thing. It exists in the minds of people and it has guided people throughout uh, human history um, in terms of their actions and their behaviors. But let's be clear, it's a myth. There is no evidence 
that is the least bit credible that supports the conclusion that the quote unquote supposed white race is somehow intellectual, intellectually, spiritually, morally, or ethically superior to any other race on this planet. But there are people who believe that and that belief then informs things like their behavior, like their policies, like the ability of a president of the United States to say that people marching with Confederate flags and Nazi flags had among them some very nice people. I, 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 thought, uh, Bill, I thought Dave Chappelle was about to deliver a line right there because that, that was so painful. Uh, it, it hurt to laugh about it. Yeah. And I'm glad you let it let in that way because um, earlier when we created this show, I had a young rapper on and he called himself a clean rapper, Malik Hawkins, very talented um, young man. He, um, he's been working as a working actor and decided to take his talents to a historically black college. But when he said that he was a clean rapper, the music industry and a producer came at me and says, well, I guess since he doesn't use the N word or call women, um, you know, things that are not what we would address our sisters and our brothers and, and mothers, and whatever, um, that evidently it was a, uh, people that use that language were bad, rap were bad rappers in the music business. So I wasn't allowed nor anyone that came into our house word to use the N word. Is this a word that we should use as a people of color, as taking back our, our right or in term of an endearment? Um, what's your take on the N word? My take on the N word is that there are as many views on that word as there are Quite frankly, there are more views on that word than there are people in our community, because a lot of us have more than one view on it. And it's not a word that I choose to use in, in any kind of conversation, but I will use it very intentionally when I am talking about history and when I am quoting someone who used that word in a way that gives the appropriate understanding to what the person was trying to talk about. So I have definitely used the word in my presentations and will continue to do so when I quote other people using that word. Um, I enjoy rap music and I've listened to clean rap and gangster rap and I like a lot of it. And so, uh, my view is that while that is an issue and it's an important issue, uh, I will get to that issue when we have resolved the systemic racism that makes America look like it does today. Quite frankly, I'm not saying this isn't significant, but I'm saying the use of that word has very little to do with why America looks like it does today when you look at the gap between Black America and white America. And so I want to deal with that gap. And that doesn't mean it's the only thing to deal with, but we have put that gap at the back of the burner for way too long. And it's time to bring it like right up front. True that. Very much so. Um, myself being in entertainment, I, I know that I don't try to tell artists or creatives how to use their words, um, but outside of their creative platform, there has to be a meeting of the minds that I respect you, I res um, you respect me, and there's just a way to operate um, outside of the art. So not, not to get sidetracked, um, and once again, we're talking to Jeff Robinson um, with the amazing documentary, Who We Are, um, and, and here's, here's the next question. What is the Willie Lynch letter? And is it really a document of how to make a slave? Could you say that again? I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Yes, not a problem. All right. What is the Willie Lynch letter? Is it really a document of how to make a slave? I'm not sure I'm familiar with that document. So you'd have to tell me about it. Um, and that's the thing about this work. I've been deeply involved 
in investigating our history for the last 10 years. And yet I haven't heard of that document. And that shows you how deeply these issues run. So this documentary, which is an hour and 57 minutes long, almost two hours long, is a reduced version of a presentation that's three and a half hours long. And even that presentation is only a summary. So if you don't mind, tell me what the Willie Lynch letter was, because it sounds really interesting. Well, just to summarize it, it was a documentary that uh, was given um, to slave owners to show them how to break the spirits and get black people um, to, to basically um, surrender to being slaves. It showed them how to beat them, how to torture them, how to um, violate their women uh, in the process in order to break the spirit of the black man. And I, I summarize it, the first thing they did was like any other um, ethnic uh, found group of people that came over to America, they separated the family and they broke the will of the family. So um, I've been told by white America that the document didn't exist. I, I've been told by um, authoritarians that um, talk about racism in the last 400 years that the document is factual. And I just figured I said with all the research you, you have done that um, you know maybe we get a confirmation of the, uh, and legitimize this conversation. But the one thing uh, moving on, and this has been well, my- Can I say I, one thing about that before you move on? Yes, sir. Because whether the document itself is a factual historical document or not, all you have to do is look at what people did. Did they separate families so that for decades after the Civil War, you were seeing letters saying, has anybody seen, and this was the last place, and those kind of things of people looking for their relatives. Did they literally breed Black women, forcing them to have sex with other men so that babies could be produced, which could continue cotton, tobacco, and rice production? Did they emasculate black men, both mentally and physically. So whether that letter existed or not, the techniques that were described in this letter used to break people's will, those have been techniques that have been used again and again and again throughout history. The Americans didn't have to think this stuff up. There were examples that they just followed and they did a really good job of it for almost 250 years. Wow. Now I'm gonna ask you a hypothetical and I have two before we move on and we're gonna talk about um, this wonderful documentary and I'm gonna tell um, anyone that's listening to this, do, do me a small favor, I'm gonna let you, let you do, do this. Um, how do people find you um, and learn a little bit more about you, get in contact with you, and tell us a little bit about the film before we ask the final two opening questions. Well, I would say the whoweareproject.org is our website. And if you come to that website, you will see information about the film, Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America. And you'll see information about what the project is doing. The film is just the first thing that the project is involved in. And there are many other activities that we're involved in, all of them directed at trying to make sure that our true and complete history is understood by everyone. So that as we start to address problems and come up with solutions, we're not trying to solve things that really aren't there. If we don't know what actually caused the problem, we will never solve it. And if we don't tell ourselves the truth about our history, we'll never know the truth about what makes America look like it does today. So that's where the Who We Are Project is going to have an impact with our youth in our communities and with corporate and government uh, officials. And as I said, the movie is just the first part of it. So come to www.thewhoweareproject.org.
All right. So this is I've been on this platform ever since I did my first public speaking um, with the Black Lives Matter and listening to people talk about why don't all lives matter. I also made a uh, statement in my um, conversation in my speaking that in order for us to resolve or come to, to a positive conclusion that we had to create allyships. And the same thing, I looked at the fact that we have over 4,000 universities and colleges throughout this country. 107 of those, of those are historically black colleges and universities. I often threaten, I said, within two years, if we took all of our talented athletes, all of our gifted melanated scholars and went to one of these 107 black colleges, what would be the landscape of education within two years? What do you think would happen, Jeff? Well, I think you see a tiny little microcosm of that at Jackson State in Mississippi uh, with Deion Sanders and the fact that he has recruited some five-star athletes that were being heavily recruited by major division one programs. And I think uh, young people, young athletes are beginning to understand that if they have the raw skills and they're trying to get into a professional career, uh, the NFL will find them with their scouting techniques and other things. And so, you know, unfortunately, what happens in America in uh, our education at the collegiate level is that if you have an athletic program that is incredibly successful, that can bring a whole lot of money to your school. And so that can increase the number of professors you can hire and it can let you expand to different buildings. And if you're able to attract uh, professors with excellent reputations, then the quality of the education you're providing goes up. And so all of that, uh, all of that is impacted by uh, the decisions that young people are making. And so it would be, uh, it would be an interesting thing to see what would happen. If I think it would take more than two years, it would probably take five years, but over the next five years, if there was a radical shift in the way uh, college recruiting works and in the way uh, the black athletes in America decided to choose their schools, um, it, would, it would create a very, very interesting situation in the NCAA well, I, and I'm for gonna, college uh, education. I'm gonna tell you, I don't speak as eloquently as you do, and I, I'm going to say it j just from the boy, boy next door, my young brothers and, and, and young sisters, the ones that are gifted, the ones that have potential, you know, let's try this experiment because I want you to remember this. They will cheer for you on Friday and Saturday nights and four years from now, they'll vote against your freedom. So just think about that when you're making your choices and going to school. So my last question in the first half of this show is this is a personal. When my athletic career ended, and I was on the streets looking for a job. I crossed the street in front of Radio City on 6th Avenue in New York. A young white lady put her back against the, the building, clutched her purse and said, I had a gun in my pocket, please don't hurt me. I had to look down at myself and look around to see who she was talking to. I was dressed in a black suit, red tie. And I told this story to Ife er earlier and a, uh, a coach back. There was nothing about me that was threatening. This was long before Karen exists. That night I called my dad to share the experience. And my father said, because I had been a standout athlete that I had been excused from racism because I was part of their plan, their plan. He says, now that I was um, a regular citizen, he said, welcome to being black. Now, Jeff, before we talk about the Who Are We project, when did you discover you were black? I can't remember a time when I didn't know it. The first white person I talked to was when I was in the first grade, a kid that lost his dog in our neighborhood and he came to get it and he was white. And, uh, and he talked to me and my brothers and the other kids in the neighborhood. Um, so growing up in the late fifties, in the, in the 60s in Memphis, Tennessee, I always knew I was black. All right, so for our listeners, I want you to think about that question and think about how you would answer that question. So I'm gonna go through and, you know, Jeff, we're gonna let you take over the show. 
you know, for our listeners that is just tuning in, I want you to understand the current narrative about the impact of anti-Black racism and white supremacy here in the United States and our social, legal, political, and economic is based on the retelling of what we believe to be the truth, which is inaccurate and the misleading. And before we begin to talk about this, I want to go ahead and give my platform, our platform, to allow the creator and co-founder of the Who We Are Project, the floor. And let's have a conversation about who we are. Jeffrey Robinson, this show is yours. Tell us about the project, how it came about, um, how it got put together, how you connected with um, Miss Crabtree, and how it ended up on Netflix. Tell us your story. Well, Andrea Crabtree, who is the chief of staff at the Who We Are Project, has worked with me for the last two decades. She was a uh, she worked with me when I was a criminal defense lawyer in Seattle. She worked with me when I went to the ACLU, their national office in 2015 as a deputy legal director. And we both left the ACLU in March of 2021 to form the Who We Are Project. And this project uh, really came out of research that I started doing almost 10, 11 years ago now. Uh, into our history and information that I was finding that I had never been taught despite having one of the best educations in America. And as I found this information, uh, I used my training as a criminal defense lawyer, which always told me that if you have a set of facts that's very complicated, put them into a timeline and see what happens. And when I did that, uh, I was amazed at what I was looking at. And I started giving presentations around the country because uh, I was amazed at how much of this information had not been part of our normal education. And I thought this information impacted me so, so much. And I thought it would impact other people as well. And as I gave this uh, presentation going around the country, uh, in March, or excuse me, in April of 2017, I gave a presentation in federal district or in Manhattan, and it was something called a continuing legal education presentation. Lawyers have to go to a certain number of hours of continuing legal education in order to keep our license current. And so this talk I was giving was part of one of these programs. And one of the lawyers in the room was Sarah Kunstler, who is uh, the daughter of the iconic civil rights lawyer, William Kunstler. And Sarah listened to the uh, presentation. And if she were here, she would tell you that she brought work to do because she had been raised in an anti-racist home and she thought she knew this history. And by the end of the presentation, she was blown away. And she and her sister contacted me and said, uh, we make films. Sarah's a lawyer, but she's also a filmmaker. And Emily is, is a filmmaker full time. And they had made a film about their father, William Kunstler, Disturbing the Universe, which was a wonderful documentary. And they made other films as well. And they said they wanted to make a movie out of my presentation. And I laughed. But uh, we looked at our calendars and we first met on June 20th, 2017. And 364 days later on Juneteenth, 2018, we were in Town Hall Theater in New York City with a packed house and seven cameras. And we filmed the stage part of the presentation. And after that, I traveled around the country giving the presentation that I had been giving uh, for a number of years and uh, Sarah and Emily and our camera crew would go with us and we'd get into a 15 person van and uh, I would give a presentation and we would talk to people in the community whose lives intersected with uh, historical events in America. And, uh, and that's how we made the film. It got to Netflix because the film was purchased by Sony Pictures Classics and it uh, premiered in theaters in January of this year. I think it showed on about 360 different uh, screens across the country. Uh, Sony Pictures Classics did a wonderful job promoting the film. 
And it was then, and I think still is, on services like Amazon and, and those kind of uh, platforms. But uh, at the beginning of this month, I think it was, it started on Netflix and we expect it to be there for quite some time. So that's one way that uh, if people are looking to see the film and they have access to Netflix, that's one place they'd be able to get it. Well, I, I'm going to tell you, months ago, my cousin, Rhonda Bondurant, um, called me and said, you got to see this film. And um, when I looked at it, I'm going with, with all that was going on, I wasn't ready for it. And then I was with a group of people on a show called Dope Living TV, and they were watching the film. So I, I, I watched it. And um, my Uncle Bill used to always tell me, he goes, you know, I got to go out and get the world ready for you because the world's not ready for you. And I realized when I made the phone call at the recommendation of my cousin, is um, I felt it was my duty to, to share the story. First, I thought we were too small of a platform in order to have someone so big and such a powerful st uh, story no, on us. That's, that's but, not true. But um, I, I was I was willing to take the chance. I am so proud and, and honored to both know you, me, me, you and Mrs. Crabtree. And um, I know Eva and I all week long have been going over and saying, we got to do this right. We got to do this right. Um, was it your goal um, to have this film have the impact on our community and our society when you guys were making this? Or did you have your fingers crossed? Uh, I didn't have my fingers crossed because uh, this was, this was uh, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. I'm not a filmmaker. I didn't know anything about the process of making a film. And I had no idea that Sarah and Emily Kunstler were so brilliantly talented and that they could take what was essentially a PowerPoint presentation and turn it into something radically different from that. So there is a filmmaking process that they brought to the table. Those are skills that I just didn't have. What I brought to the table was the presentation and the information. And so it was the combination of that uh, that, uh, that created this film. I have spent the last 10 years almost going around the country talking to people about this information. And I've seen the impact it has on people. So I didn't have a whole lot of doubt about whether this film would have an impact on people. I was confident that it would because I was confident that there were many, 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 the majority of people in America who had no idea about the depth of this information and that learning this information would shape their confidence in looking at America and saying, I understand why it looks this way. They're gonna be looking and saying, wait a minute, there's a whole nother reason why this looks this way. And I didn't know anything about it. And at that moment, that moment of cognitive dissonance, that's when people do things that they haven't done before. And so uh, I'm not trying to sound like I, you know, was I nervous? Of course I was nervous. Did I want it to be successful? Of course I did, but it wasn't like, you know, I, I didn't spend all this time doing this and then all the energy that it took to create this film while we were working at full-time jobs, you know, in addition, uh, if I had doubts about this, I guarantee you, I would not have done it. Well, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I shared um, the, the link to, to this movie with several people that come into my health club and they wear a hat called Mega. Um, <laughs> and I, I laugh every time I, I see that, especially when um, it comes up in your film. And I'm going to ask you about this, Make America a Great Nation again. And I guess the person that created Mega uh, misinterpreted um, the slogan. But they're all white people and they all felt a certain kind of way. I had one uh, young man, uh, Larry, he's an attorney, heavily respects you and now he's following you. And he says, this fucking country is racist. And he says, I didn't know how racist it was until I had a young lady that was a diehard um, mega supporter. And she came to me two days after watching the film and she was in tears and she, uh, she, she apologized. She said, I didn't know. I had another person that basically has her way about feeling about the world. And she says, look, 
this forces you to face your own reality watching this film. She goes, we need to have everyone see this film, regardless of what the reality is. Once you know the truth, then you can settle with your own reality and we can respect that. Um, <laughs> and Jeff, for me, and you, you can talk about Andrew Jackson, you can talk about the Electric College. Uh, I didn't know there was a third verse to the Star Spangled Banner. I'll let you speak on that, but I can't look at a $20 bill um, and celebrate the value of that bill because um, it has my, my, my freedom written all over it. So let's talk about Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, uh, like most politicians and like every human being that's ever existed, is you know a contradiction in terms to a certain extent. There are, uh, he was clearly uh, a very smart man. He was clearly a very strong military leader. And he was clearly a really effective politician. But Andrew Jackson never made any bones about who he was. He got through Congress, he got passed through Congress an act called the Indian Removal Act. I just want you to reflect on the name of that act. They weren't pussyfooting around. They weren't using euphemism, euphemisms. He's like, we are going to take the Indians and we are going to remove them so that white people can take their land. This is who Andrew Jackson was. He was responsible for campaigns of absolute terror and genocide, quite frankly, against Native Americans uh, for much of his life. And he was a vicious owner of enslaved people. And that's one of the things we show in the film is an article that he put in the newspaper in 1803, trying to offer a reward for the return of an enslaved person who had escaped from him. And he gave a description of what the guy was wearing, a drab great coat and slacks, and he might go to Louisiana or he might head north uh, for Detroit and uh, gave indications of uh, his physical makeup. And he said, $50 reward, we'll pay all expenses, and I'll give you $10 extra for every 100 lashes anyone will give him to the amount of 300. So I had to read that again and again and again to make sure that I understood it. When I first found it, I thought, I'm not sure I believe this until I got into historical records and saw an actual copy of the newspaper article. That's one of the things we show in the film. And what that meant was if you caught this enslaved person and it cost you $5 to hold him until Andrew Jackson arrived, well, you'd get that $5 and you'd get the $50 reward. And depending on how strong your arm was and how vacant your empathy for human existence was, you could earn maybe another $30 by giving him 300 lashes with a whip. But if your arm got tired and you could only give 100 lashes, then you could get another $10. So the fact that Andrew Jackson posted this article in a newspaper, which was intended to get the widest circulation possible, shows that he had no qualms about admitting exactly who he was. And it also shows that he had no concern about anybody being arrested for anything like this. Now, I suggest that if you put out an article in the newspaper today and ask people to find someone to hold them against their will, to use a whip and hit them on the back between 100 and 300 times, and that you give money to the person who did this, I think you'd be in big trouble. No one would do that. Andrew Jackson knew he could do it because he knew that that kind of behavior was completely consistent with who and what America was at that time. 
He was also president of the United States. I, I, I was going to men, men, mention that. Um, fast forward, not exactly forward to current times, but there was a part in our history when uh, Black people prospered. They had a place called Black Wall Street in Oklahoma. And um, we hear stories about the riot uh, in uh, uh, Oklahoma. Your uh, film tells the truth about that. Can you share that experience and that conversation as far as that part of the film? Well, I, I will say this, that uh, when I first started to read about the Tulsa massacre, uh, the articles that I was reading described it as the Tulsa riot. And I thought, this is not a very accurate description. It doesn't sound like a riot to me. It sounds like a massacre. And so I read historical documents and did research and the narrative that I came up with that was very accurate, but not completely accurate, was that the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma was one of the richest neighborhoods in America in 1921. I didn't say one of the richest black neighborhoods. I said one of the richest neighborhoods. And the level of wealth and the level of success in that neighborhood was staggering. The number of stores and businesses, put it this way, there were almost $10 million in unpaid insurance claims after the Greenwood neighborhood was destroyed. So that gives you a concept of how big that neighborhood was and how wealthy it was. 35 blocks, four square miles. On May 30th, a young black man was arrested because he was accused of assaulting a woman in an elevator. And when you get into it, it is clear that there was nothing like that that happened. And if you get into it a little deeper, it also becomes uh, somewhat clear that this young black man and young white women actually knew each other and may have been somewhat involved with each other. But that's not the narrative that happened. The young black man was arrested in a lynch mob court and they headed for the courthouse. Well, the black men in Greenwood had recently been fighting white supremacists on the other side of the Atlantic in World War I. And when they came home, they still had their weapons and they still had their military training. And so they went down to the courthouse with their guns, not to break anybody out of jail, but to keep the lynch mob out of the jail. And the cost for that was that over the next two days, the Greenwood neighborhood was essentially burned to the ground. Uh, a rich, I thought white people rented airplanes to do what I'm about to describe, but I have found out continuing the research that it's very likely that a rich white man in Tulsa gave airplanes that he owned to white citizens. And what is beyond dispute is airplanes circled the Greenwood neighborhood. They dropped burning balls of turpentine on the homes and businesses. And when the home was burned from the top, People ran out into the street and they were shot dead by white people. The local press at the time would report somewhere between 30 and 80 people dead. The more research I did, the number came up to over 300. And when we actually went to Tulsa to film this segment for the movie, and we met with the activists who were there, Chief Amusan, who was the head of the African Ancestral Society, Christy Williams, who is an advocate there working on these issues. What we found out is that there are 4,000 people who cannot be accounted for. Whether all of them died or not is unclear, but they can't be accounted for after that massacre. And so when you see an event of that magnitude, and you understand that it was taught virtually nowhere in American history. When you understand that zero people were arrested for what happened. And when you understand that <laughs> the thing that probably brought it into the American consciousness most was an HBO series called Watchmen that had a, 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 a depiction of the Greenwood massacre in the first episode. And people were like, oh my God, did this really happen? And so think about what it would take 
to literally wipe this event from the historical record because that's what happened until very, very recently. And the last thing I'll say about it is don't go thinking it's unique because it wasn't. Massacres like this occurred at least two dozen times between the late 1860s and up until the, the late 1920s. And obviously after that as well. So these, these are the kind of things that are erased from history. And if you, I will end this way. I've said that once before, but I will end this way. If you went to the Greenwood neighborhood today, you would see an economically depressed neighborhood with very little black ownership of any land or businesses in that neighborhood. And if you were trying to come up with a solution to that problem, and you had never heard about the Tulsa massacre, you knew nothing about the wealth that had been destroyed there, you might look at that and say, well, this is another place where Black people need to grab their own bootstraps and work a little harder. And, you know, we can invest a little money. It'll be white owned, but we'll help these businesses and maybe they'll get a little bit better. But if you knew about the Greenwood massacre, the Tulsa massacre, if you knew about the property and the wealth that had been destroyed, you would look at that neighborhood and say, no, 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 there is a different reason that this neighborhood looks like it does. And that's the power of history. George Orwell said it most ominously, who controls the past controls the future. And that's a nice seg segue to um, think about because you, you brought the fact that we're un claimed insurance policies that was there we no, not unclaimed these were insurance claims that were made and they were denied by the insurance uh -huh. companies because it was a riot so almost 10 million dollars in 1921 money so we're not talking about 10 million dollars and that value today. We're talking 1920 literally a century ago. Those are billions. That's the kind of wealth that was destroyed and that is a major reason why the Greenwood neighborhood looks like it does today. And if you want a little uh uh treat just to show you how depraved this whole thing is, several years ago they discovered mass graves. And the University of Oklahoma said, "Hey, we will come down, we'll give you a below ground looking radar equipment for free, we will help. This is an historic you know, discovery, mass graves that could be connected to the Greenwood massacre. And after a couple of them were opened and some bodies were reinterred, the mayor shut the whole thing down. And he said, well, it's gonna be too divisive if we continue to discover just what's in these mass graves. Imagine that. I'm shaking my head. I'm shaking my head because I, I, I know before Dr. King was assassinated and he was about to, to give us a, a speech, um, he had talked about uh, reparations. You had mentioned that conversation in, in your film. Um, and I, I know our young people are talking about when they're gonna pay us for whatever. Your film states that that debt has been paid. Can you explain that so our, our, our people will understand? what reparations our government paid and how they paid it and who they paid it to? Well, let's be clear. The concept of reparations is an international concept and it doesn't just apply to the United States. Having said that, the concept in the United States is absolutely clear. There is a bill before Congress right now called H.R. 40. Why is it called H.R. 40? because it was patterned after Special Field Order 15, which was issued by General Sherman during the Civil War. This is the order that said every freed enslaved person would get 40 acres. There was a mule that people connect that to and the mule was actually thrown in later, but that's why it's called HR 40 because of the 40 acres promise. Well, what many people don't know is that there were black people that were given land pursuant to that promise from the, coastal, from the coast of Georgia all the way down to what is now Florida. And after Lincoln was assassinated and Andrew Johnson became president, that land was taken back. 
But when it comes to reparations, HR 40 would establish a commission. What would that commission do? Investigate the true history of slavery and the vestiges of slavery, which continued long after 1865 and up, and up to and including today. And then to make specific proposals for reparatory legislation to Congress. That's what HR 40 would do. And people say, oh my God, it's too big a job. We've never done anything like that. It can't be done. And this is where George Orwell comes in because he says, if you control the past, people will never know that reparations have been done twice before in the United States. And so by controlling the past, you convince people today that reparations are impossible because they've never been done before. That's just a lie. Nine months before Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, he signed the Compensated Emancipation Act, which gave the equivalent of about $8,000 in today's money to Washington DC slave owners for every enslaved person that would be freed under the Emancipation Proclamation. And that commission ended up paying $1 million in 1862 money to Washington DC slave owners because he didn't want the DC slave owners revolting. And it was paid for lost property. So we have paid reparations for slavery. They were just paid to the people that were enslaving folks. And that was just the first time that the United States had that experience because in 1988, Japanese Americans, activists from that community who had worked for a decade or longer on this same issue of reparations, their work resulted in the 1988 bill that paid 1.6 billion, not million, billion dollars to Japanese Americans for three and a half years of imprisonment during World War II and for the land and rights that were taken from them during that time of imprisonment. That $1.6 billion didn't come anywhere close to compensating them for what was taken from them. But it was a recognition by the country along with an official apology and along with other things. It was a recognition, a reckoning with what we were in the past and how we had to rectify that before we can move forward. So when people say reparations are complicated, reparations have never been done before, this, the first thing is true, they are complicated. And that's why you have a commission which does the investigation and makes recommendation. So you have really smart people figuring it out. When people say it's never been done before, that's just because our history has been erased. And speaking of our history, and I know that um, Ife has a question, I wanna ask one more question before we go through. Um, and Ife, it's that, um, you know, I, I looked at your background and I love your background. I can't wait to see it on thousands of people, so hundreds of thousands of people wearing the shirt and talking about this um, project. But I also, have to look at the fact of being an athlete. A young brother was denied his livelihood by taking a knee. And through your film, I discovered there was a third verse that we never sung to the Star Spangled Banner. So um, I, I think if people actually listened to the words and saw the words, they would understand why Carl, uh, Mr. Kaepernick took a knee to that. Um, I still struggle looking at uh, the American flag. I know as an athlete, I used to look at it and thought that this great country allowed me to play football and not be enslaved. I look at the flag a little different now, now that I know the truth. So I'm learning who we are, who I am. So <laughs> um, talk, let's talk about the Star Spangled Banner and why we don't sing the third verse of that. I think uh, what people don't know from the way we were taught history is that uh, Patrick Henry was in Washington, D.C. three weeks before he wrote the poem that became the Star Spangled Banner. And what he was watching was a conflict between the British and the Americans during the War of 1812. 
and the British were assisted by a group called the Colonial Marines, who were escaped enslaved black men who fought for the British. Why? Because the British said, if we win, you get your freedom. And these men, the Colonial Marines, were vicious because they were fighting for their freedom. And guess what? They knew all the roads. They knew the rivers. They knew how to get from one place to another without being seen. So they were incredibly valuable. And, and, and John uh, Francis Scott Key watched as the Colonial Marines and the British soldiers pushed the Americans back into Washington, D.C. and set the White House on fire. Three weeks later, he's in Baltimore Harbor watching the bombing of Fort McHenry, which starts the uh, war, the, the, the bombing of Fort McHenry. And he writes this poem out of patriotic fervor, and it becomes the national anthem some years later. The poem had four verses, and I will recite for you the third verse, which you may have never heard before. And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and country, would leave us no more? Translated, where are those people that said that if we went to war, we were going to lose our home and our country? I don't see them standing around anymore because look at what we've done. Here's where it picks up. Where have those people gone? Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. And no refuge can save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave and the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Francis Scott Key had just seen black soldiers setting the White House on fire. And he was saying, we are going to hunt you down. No refuge can save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight. And when we find you, we're going to put you in the dirt or the gloom of the grave. That's who Francis Scott Key was. And to put a period to this topic, he was the city prosecutor in Washington, D.C. after the War of 1812, and he prosecuted a man for possessing abolitionist literature, and he asked for the death penalty for this offense. And his closing argument, which I'm going to paraphrase it, this will be close to an exact quote. I may have one word or two wrong. This is part of what he said in his closing argument. Are you willing, gentlemen? to surrender your country to the abolitionist whose taste it is to associate and amalgamate with the Negro. That's who Francis Scott Key was. Go ahead, Ife. That, that, was, that was pretty powerful right there. Um, and, it, and it calls to mind um, what's going on now in our schools with the critical race um, theory. Um, how, what is your opinion of the critical race um, theory, um, Jeff? And I, I really feel that your project is, is something that needs to be in every school because whether you're black, you're white, um, whether, whether you're, you're Mexican, whatever ethnicity you are, if you're in America, um, whether you're an immigrant or you, you, your, your family's been here for a while, this is a film you need to sit down and, and, and see because I learned from this movie and it's one of those movies where you're somebody before the movie, but you're definitely somebody after the movie. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna remember when you watch this movie. So, what, so to, to bring it back, what is, what is the critical race theory to you and was any, of your thinking making this project um, pretty much something to counteract this, this movement that, that people have going on in schools? Because I was very enlightened and I'm like, anybody who's in middle school or high school has to see this film. Well, uh, I went to law school long ago enough that I actually took a class from Derek Bell, one of the people who is credited with developing critical race theory. I did not have critical race theory in my head when I was putting this presentation together. In fact, 
critical race theory wasn't even on the horizon when the stage presentation that's the backbone of this film was done. Remember, the stage presentation was filmed Juneteenth, 2018. George Floyd was still alive. There had not been anything like an insurrection at the Capitol. And no one, if you said CRT, somebody would be saying, is that a breakfast cereal or, you know, what is that? So, and it's very clear. In conservative think tanks, they came up with the idea, we're going to take critical race theory, we're going to say, we're going to try and put under that umbrella any education about racism or part of our history that's not very uh, uh, palatable or flattering. We're going to put anything about race under the umbrella of critical race theory. And then we're going to say it's made to make white people feel guilty, to make white children feel bad, and it's just not fair. And, and then we're going to put that out into the media. We're going to have that start as a mantra so that we can develop that narrative in the country. And, you know, there are documents showing how they did this. So critical race theory is a law school curriculum. So if I am a parent of a fourth grader and I'm screaming at the school board meeting, don't you dare teach my child in the fourth grade critical race theory, it's the equivalent of that parent saying, don't you dare teach my child nuclear physics in the fourth grade. No fourth grader is going to be taught that because it's not a fourth grade course. So if they're screaming, don't teach my child something that the child wouldn't be taught in the first place, now you have to ask yourself, what's really going on here? And the concept that finding out the truth about our history is going to make white people and white children feel guilty or uncomfortable, that's easy. It's like that's just ridiculous. There is no person alive today who had anything to do with the policy of enslavement in America from 1619 to 1865. Not one of us. We have no reason to feel guilty about that, about the Tulsa massacre, about separate but equal, because we didn't have anything to do with that. The issue is, how has that impacted us today? Because we do have something to do with that. So it's not that people don't want their children to feel guilty. I believe it's that people don't want their children to understand that they have a responsibility to change the way the United States works. That's what people are afraid of. They are afraid that this information, if kids see it, it's like you said, they're one person before and a different person after. And this fear has been expressed in American politics since at least 1837, when John, John C. Calhoun, one of the most virulent racists in American history, was writing about the teaching of abolition in the schools. And he was writing, you better stop it. You better stop it. Because if you teach these kids abolition, slavery is done for. And then in the document the Trump administration put out three days before they left office, a piece of something called the 1776 report. They used the exact same phrase John C. Calhoun did, the minds of a rising generation. And what this Trump document says is, we have to teach education about our history that is patriotic. And quite frankly, I think the Who We Are project and this film are two of the most patriotic things that I have ever done in my entire life because I actually love the country enough to say something when it's going wrong. I'm not gonna let my country sit there with crap all over their face and not tell them about it. Wipe that off. We've got to do better than that. So if you want to talk about patriotism, let's start with, are you willing to tell the truth about our history? That's awesome. And it's funny that you said um, John C. Calhoun. I'm in, I'm in South Carolina. Um, and one of my hometowns is Orangeburg, South Carolina. So when you said John C. Calhoun, that struck a nerve. And, and not to right. give the film away, 
Um, but do want to let you know that you you did have a very poignant conversation um, with somebody with the Confederate flag in the movie, and that was that was very important. So you know, I always um, Kevin always smiles when he hears this. I always in, interject South Carolina in almost any conversation I have to let people know where I'm currently at, but also to let people know that not too much has changed because this is the home of Lindsey Graham. Um, there, there's a lot of MAGA supporters, and and it and it took. So, um, this may be a trigger warning to certain people, but I have to say because I'm, I'm in South Carolina, so I have people that are directly affected by it. It took the Emanuel Nine situation happening for the Confederate flag to finally come down. You are absolutely right. That is the only reason that flag came down. That is the reason. And the, the, the one other thing I would just say about South Carolina uh, is that I think maybe a lot of people realize this, but for those of us who are directly descended from people who were brought here in the transatlantic slave trade, almost 70 to 80% of us, if we were able, would trace our history back to someone who walked off a boat in Charleston, South Carolina. That's how significant Charleston was as a landing spot for enslaved people, because as you probably know, that harbor is huge. It is easily accessible to the ocean. And as you're coming up the Amer the East Coast, that's you know a, a perfect place for the people to be offloaded and then spread out across the South. So Charleston has, Charleston in the state of South Carolina has a very uh, significant history when it comes to what made our country look like it does today. Exactly. I, I think it was the first state to um, secede back in the civil rights era or, or one of the first, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I think, and it was one of the, one of the earliest where we could find an actual record of a slave patrol. And I think it was 1704. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you, you, you brought up slave patrol because um, I wanna see how this ties in the conversation. And you mentioned this in, in your film of getting people to understand because I know the conversation in my household when um, I was growing up, relationships between blacks and police officers why do they fear that? And then I'm going to tie in a conversation with Bill Clinton, and I'm going to let you address that. Well, the thing I would say about uh, policing is that, once again, if you control the past, you control the future. You need to understand how policing formed in America and what its original intent was. In the very Constitution that formed our country, Article 4 says that any person held to service or labor, because they didn't want to use the word slave or enslaved, must be returned upon demand. The very document that formed our country, the Constitution of the United States, says in Article 4 that any attempt by Black people to be free is illegal. It is unconstitutional. And so, this is part of the job that was given to burgeoning law enforcement groups all over America because it's in the Constitution. And if you understand that, part of, part of that goes to show how people in policing would view people from our community. Our very existence was on the border of being criminal. And then after the Civil War, the South very quickly said, oh, well, there's another way to get these Black people back as close to slavery as possible, because in the 13th Amendment, it said you can't use slavery unless somebody's convicted of a crime. Okay. So states literally went hog wild enforcing new laws and arresting Black people. So who would do the arresting? It was the police. When you had black codes and separate but equal laws that were being passed, who was going to enforce those things? It was the police. And anytime there was a black uprising when issues of violence against our community would happen, like in the Tulsa massacre, 
when there was any pushback, they brought in the police and federal troops. So police have been given the job of suppressing freedom in the black community, literally since the country started. And then once that, that direct suppression of freedom was taken out of the mix with the end of the Civil War and the 14th Amendment and things that came after that, the police enforced the new Jim Crow. I'll call it the old Jim Crow versus the new Jim Crow. So the police have been enforcing laws in our communities in ways that have been criminalizing our communities far beyond any rational means. And this is part of the history. So if a police department has been doing this since its inception, that is a culture that's embedded deeply in that department over decades and decades and decades. So when you look at policing today, it's like, why would you expect it to be any different? I'd expect it to look exactly like it does look. And that is just another symptom of how desperately we need to address these problems of race, which flow through virtually every area of our community and society. Jeff, we, we, we can talk another two hours um, about this. The, the movie is freaking amazing, if I can say that. I would like to say it differently, but we have young children that are going to be uh, listening to this. Um, the Who We Are um, Project, the Chronicle of Racism in America, it's got to be at the top of your must-see uh, list. I'm going to predict the future. There's an Oscar uh, in your future. If um, it does not happen, it's a foul. Um, people have got to see this. 107 historically Black colleges and university should play this at least 12 times during the course of a school year, just in order to, to educate. Hopefully this podcast will be part uh, of that. Jeff, tell us how we get in touch with you, because I know you do speaking engagements all across um, the country. And this is another conversation that needs to be had. There is no excuse for it. not one historically Black college not to have Jeff Robinson and his team on the stage talking about who we are. So Jeff, tell us how we get in touch with you and thank you for letting us know who we are. And we have thank still a you. couple more questions. Don't, don't go anywhere. Okay. Uh, once again, come to www.thewhowearproject.org. Our website will give you information on what we're doing, how you can contact us about potential speaking engagements, how you can screen the film. And uh, I've already said it, but most importantly, it will give you information about what's coming because we have much more coming. All right, uh, Aoife and I are, are gonna go over um, some movie facts and some tidbits on whatever. We're just gonna say a name um, and you're gonna share as soon as that name hit, hits you, how's it land on you? Go ahead, Aoife. Okay. Um, Edmund, yeah, we're gonna do Edmund Pettis. Uh, Edmund Pettus is one of the most virulent, historically racist people in Alabama history, and his name is on a bridge, which is uh, a civil rights iconic place. And uh, I wish that that bridge would be renamed because it honors uh, the Grand Dragon of the KKK in that area, and uh, his name has no place on that bridge. All right, I'm, I'm gonna shoot one over here because um, Forrest Gump is one of my favorite movies, but until I saw this name and I recalled a, a uh, caption that Forrest Gump was named after Nathan Brad Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest. Bedford Forrest, who is he? Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate soldier. He was a general. He was one of the first leaders of and, and people who founded the Ku Klux Klan. And he was one of the most, he was one of the richest people in the history of Memphis, Tennessee, my hometown. He was a vicious enslaver of people who made all kinds of money from slavery. And after the Civil War, he still made money victimizing the Black community. Um, 
The only thing that I have to say about Nathan Bedford Forrest is that he was at least honest about the purpose of the Civil War. People have, as, as the film points out, people have all kinds of reasons for the Civil War. It wasn't about slavery, it was about this or that or whatever. And Nathan Bedford Forrest was quoted as saying, of course it was about slavery. If we ain't fighting to preserve slavery, then what the hell are we fighting for? That's who Nathan Bedford Forrest was. And that's the truth. So we have two last questions. Um, Ife. All right. So um, question, um, is there anything or anyone you wanted to include in this film, but didn't get a chance to do so? And why was this so? The editing of this film was one of the hardest things uh, that we had to do. And let's be clear, Emily Kunstler edited this film. We all had input, but Emily did this, and the job she did on this editing was unbelievable. I am, I am just, it was an amazing job. But for example, you mentioned uh, the Emmanuel Nine. We went and interviewed the pastor, and we actually sat in that room when you walk through the doors on the bottom floor where Dylan Roof slaughtered those people and injured a whole bunch of others. That didn't make the film. We interviewed the woman who answered the phone in the 16th Street Baptist Church when the bomb threat came in. And a voice said something like three minutes and she hung up the phone, started walking, walking back toward where the four girls who were killed were and the bomb went off. We interviewed her, that didn't make the film. So there's all kinds of stuff. And, and quite frankly, every interview that you saw in the film was at least two hours long. So there's all kinds of information that we have. And that's why I say there is more coming because we have so much information that we've gathered over the last 10 years that Andrea and I have gathered over the last 10 years. So much footage of what we did for the film, for the movie that's not in the movie. And we continue to do this work and collect this information. So, um, they were very hard decisions, but uh, I, I, at the end of the day, uh, what Emily did was fantastic. All right, so I, I know I said I was gonna ask one question, I'm gonna ask two questions, and, um, and then we're gonna wrap up and I wanna thank you again. And you can thank uh, and give credit to everyone that had taken part, because I don't have a list of all the people that made this so um, freaking fantastic. And I, and I have an important question. One, I'm gonna say, Answer me this, why do they fear us? And what do we need to do in order for us to be truly free as a people and as a country, in your opinion? I think that uh, the reason so many people fear us <clears throat> is at a basic level, they react something like this. If those people get freedom, and power, they're gonna do to us exactly what we did to them. And if that sentiment was truly a sentiment that had hold in the black community, you would have seen this thing go up in a ball of flames a long time ago. Our community has never wanted revenge. A reckoning is very different from revenge. A reckoning is when you look somebody in the eye and say, you were wronged, there was no excuse for it, and we now have to do something to make it right. So I think getting over that fear of we are looking for revenge is one thing, because that's not what Black America is looking for. And in terms of what we need to do, we have had a 200-year experiment, 250-year experiment, if you want to go all the way back, on what will happen if you try and move a country toward true racial justice 
and at the same time, you deny the truth about your past. What will happen? And what will happen is you'll take two steps forward and three steps backward. And that's what we've been doing for the last 200 years. Two steps forward and three steps backward. Why is that? Because when we go to solve a problem, we are ignoring the root cause of that problem. We are ignoring the history that created that problem. And by ignoring it, we are doomed to come up with solutions that will miss the mark. So we just got to take a look in the mirror and actually see what's there. And, and we go from there. Jeff, I ask this of all, at least 90% of everyone that comes on to um, this program, talking with WIT, Kevin and Son, and um, I'm gonna grant you two of them. I'm gonna ask you your ask, A-S-K, and I want you to think about it because on, on this show, since August 4th, 2021, I've had four people that have come on here and their ask has been granted. I always say to, to our listeners, we, we're not looking to have a million and one followers, but we have people that follow this show. They have a higher call to action. They don't drive by an accident. They stop to help. So I'm going to grant you two because you, this has been so powerful. I know I can make a whole list, but if I were to ask you your ask and you can have these come true by someone that is watching this, what would your two asks be? <clears throat> Activate everyone in our community who is eligible to vote in the midterm elections. I understand being frustrated. I understand thinking the system is broken. I understand feeling like, oh, my vote doesn't count. Well, look at what's happened in the Supreme Court. Take a look around at these CRT laws that we've been talking about. We are at the same tipping point that I talked about in our movie. That tipping point we were at in 2018, we're at that same tipping point. And if you will get out and vote, something different can happen after these midterm elections. And I'm not being Pollyannish about it, I'm just saying, if you think you're frustrated with the quote unquote liberals, where this country is headed is someplace very different. So make it a priority. If you have to inconvenience yourself at a major level, get out and vote and help other people vote. And thank you for giving me two because my second one is this. Andrea and I left the Who We Are, left the ACLU in March of 2001 to form the Who We Are Project. When I talk about everything this project has done, all the presentations that we have given, all of the raising of $1.2 million to fund this film, which we basically did with two or three other friends helping us do it because we wanted to make the film before we sold distribution rights to anybody. We did not want someone coming to us and saying, oh, we'll give you the rest of the money for the film. We just want you to change this or tweak that. And so everything we have done has been done essentially by me and Andrea and a couple of consultants. We are in huge fundraising mode. We have multiple projects that are out there. And there are one of my favorite rap songs from back in the day had a verse, everywhere that I go, I got people I know who got people they know. So if you know somebody, that works in an organization that is looking to fund work that is going to make a major difference in the next five years, tell them about the Who We Are project. If you've got connection to some philanthropist, tell them about the Who We Are project. Ask them to watch our film, and I'm willing to bet on the film. If they watch our film, they'll get in touch with us. And I am going to second that, and I think Ethan will second that. Uh, also, Andrea, you have not sp spoken. And um, I, I would like people to know that you are not a avatar. Um, at, at least say hi to our audience and unmute yourself. Um, Andrea Crabtree. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Um, as I have done for over 20 years, I let the power of Jeffrey Robinson's voice speak on these things. But um, 
I greatly appreciate you inviting us to this show today and do think that um, Jeff's asks are going to come true. I, 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 I'm going to second that. And I will tell you that this show, this platform is yours at any time. If Ife, myself, or RMK Productions can do anything to champion your cause, we will be there. If you're on a speaking event on the East Coast, I will be there. If it's someplace that we can get, I will get Ife there to, um, to also be there. We, are, we want to be part of the Who We Are project because I am learning who we are. You know, freedom is not a justice that cannot be partialed out in pieces just to salute or stimulate or help someone's political convenience. Coretta Scott King, King, the wife of Dr. King, basically says, I don't believe that you could stand for freedom for one group and deny the freedom to others. I appreciate you, um, Andrea Crabtree, Mr. Jeffrey Hero Robinson, for creating this program, for you guys being not only disciples of change, but warriors of the cause. I appreciate my loyal fans and listeners for um, staying with us. This was an extended version of Talking Wit, W-I-T, Kevin and Son. And so hopefully you'll stay to the end or you'll share this podcast. Go to RMK Productions and network on our YouTube page and like, share and follow. There's more to come. This is probably not going to be our last rodeo with these two. Um, also, if you like to be on this show, and Jeff, Andrea, if you guys have people connected that you think that would like to be showcased, our show is all about people you should know. These are the stories that, of heroes that are never get told. We're not looking for celebrities and stars in order to pad their bank account. We're looking for people with a higher purpose that wants to help educate and help our communities. Um, you know, I often struggle with the ending uh, process of this. And freedom is something that's never won, it is earned. And it's gotta be won by the new generation. And I think Jeff, um, this is not original to me. I heard you say it um, in the film. And my grandfather always said, when you get to a point that you can help someone else, it is your duty to do so. Reach one, teach one. And with that said, I thank everyone. We'll fade to black and we're out. <laughs>